Uh, I think as people uh, join, uh, let me start the session. <clears throat> so good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everybody who's joined. A very warm welcome to the inaugural Norwich Institute for Sustainable Development John Innes Foundation Lecture. I'm honored that we have such an eminent speaker to launch this annual lecture series in Professor Ratan Lal, and I'm delighted that so many people have registered to join us today. You are all very warmly welcome to this lecture. In a moment, I'll start the formal proceedings, but first, if you'll allow me, I just wanted to introduce myself to all of you, the Norwich Institute for Sustainable Development and our sponsor, John Innes Foundation. I'm Nitya Rao, I'm Professor of Gender and Development in the School of International Development at the University of East Anglia. And in that role, uh, through my research, teaching and engagement, I have been championing gender equality and women's empowerment, particularly in rural areas in context of growing uh, threat to climate variability and climate change and also economic precarity across Africa and Asia mainly. I was also delighted to be appointed as the first director of the new Norwich Institute for Sustainable Development in 2020. The NISD or the Norwich Institute for Sustainable Development is a new center of excellence which will apply world leading transdisciplinary research to pressing global problems. The Institute <clears throat> harnesses the complementary strengths across the Norwich Research Park, the John Innes uh, Center, the Sainsbury Laboratories, Erlen Institute, Quadrum Institute, and the UEA. And the initial focus is on food security and sustainability and internationally recognized research strength here in Norwich. The Institute has been launched with very generous funding from the John Innes Foundation, a UK-based charity, which is passionate about the role of science uh, and the role that science can play in creating sustainable societies of the future. So before we start, I would like to thank the John Innes Foundation for their financial support to both the Institute and this lecture and for their encouragement, advice, and wise counsel over the last year. I would like to also thank Professor Ratan Lal for honoring us today with his words in this first uh, lecture of the John Innes Foundation. And I would like to also thank my team at the NISD for all the work that has gone into today's uh, event. So before we start, before I introduce our speaker for today, I just would like to briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor David Richardson, the Vice Chancellor of the University of East Anglia. Uh, Professor Richardson has been a keen supporter of our work at NISD and uh, uh, as the Vice Chancellor, but also his academic background is in bacterial biochemistry, where he has used a range of disciplines to unravel the respiratory processes of anaerobic bacteria from soils, the marine environments, and the human gastrointestinal tract. And he has published extensively and been cited extensively. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Richardson is uh, presently on a faint journey, but he has very kindly recorded a special message to welcome Professor Ratan Lal and for this event. So may I please request uh, Naomi to play the event, uh, the message from Professor Richardson. Hello, it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome Professor Ratan Lal to the Norwich Research Park. Professor Lal is the Distinguished University Professor of Soil Science and founding director of the Carbon Management and Sequestration Center at Ohio State University. He won the United Nations 2020 World Food Prize for his soil-centric approach to increasing food production that restores and conserves natural resources and mitigates climate change. His innovative soil-saving techniques were developed in a career that began more than 50 years ago and have benefited millions of smallholders, improved food and nutrition security and protected natural tropical ecosystems in Africa and Asia. Now his lecture today will be the first in what will be an annual lecture series to be hosted by the Norris Institute for Sustainable Development. And this institute was established last February with generous support from the John Innes Foundation. To honor this generosity, we have named the lecture series after the foundation. Professor Lal, a warm welcome to Norwich and what I wish was not just a virtual visit, 
I tremendously look forward to this, today's lecture and expect that we will find ourselves enriched by it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Richardson. Uh, I would next like to introduce our sponsor for today, Mr. Peter Innes, chair of the John Innes Foundation. Peter maintains an unbroken line of Innes family members who have been trustees of the John Innes Foundation for 100 years. Mr. Innes served in the British Army and then worked in the financial services sector in Hong Kong and Scotland. Now retired, Peter has been a strong supporter of the NISD from its very inception through its development and now in its first year of operation. Thank you, Mr. Innes, over to you. Please go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Nidja. Um, well, first of all, can I say how honored I am to be speaking to you all this first annual John Innes Foundation lecture organized by the Norwich Institute for Sustainable Development. For those of you not based in Norwich, I should perhaps explain uh, that the John Innes Foundation is a charity that was set up over a hundred years ago by a request from my ancestor, John Innes. And I think it's particularly appropriate that this first lecture should focus on soil, because from the outset, the scientific study of soil has been a feature of the research we've supported. I'd add too that Norwich is perhaps unique now in the world, in the way that institutes located there and are in a position to link the study of soil to plants, to food, and through that to human health and well-being. The trustees of the foundation, as Nietzsche said, are passionate about the role that science plays in creating sustainable societies in which we hope all our descendants will thrive in years to come. It's for that reason we're so excited to be involved with the new Norwich Institute for Sustainable Development and that the 2020 UN World Food Prize winner, Professor Ratan Lal, is giving the inaugural John Innes Foundation lecture today. I'd like to thank him, to thank, thank those who've worked so very hard to establish the NISD and to thank you all too for participating in this inaugural lecture we need to reflect on what's said through a lens of global urgency. Perhaps a question for all of us should be, what can I do tomorrow that I didn't consider yesterday? Whether that be new thinking, new actions, new research ideas, or new partnerships. I know we'll all have an enjoyable and thought-provoking afternoon, and I'm very glad to, to be um, introducing this lecture. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter, for your very kind uh, words and for emphasizing the importance of science really in helping us find global solutions. It gives me now great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Ratan Lal. As has already been mentioned by the Vice Chancellor that Professor Lal won the World Food Prize in 2020 for developing and mainstreaming a soil-centric approach to increase, increasing food production that restores and conserves natural resources and mitigates climate change. Over his career spanning more than five decades and four continents, starting in India through Africa and now in the US, Professor Lal has promoted innovative soil saving techniques benefiting the livelihoods of many millions of smallholder farmers, really contributing to the food and nutritional security of billions of people, particularly in natural tropical ecosystems. Professor Lal worked at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IITA, for more than two decades, and now serves as Distinguished University Professor of Soil Science and the founding director of the Carbon Management and Sequestration Center at the Ohio State University. His academic papers, I believe, have been cited more than 100,000 times. In addition to the World Food Prize last year, Professor Lal has won many international prizes and recognitions, including as a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize awarded to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in 2007. Professor Lal is a past president of the International Union of Soil Sciences. Today, he will talk to us about managing soils as the foundation for sustainable agriculture. I think this is a key priority for all of us. And in that context, what we need 
from the upcoming UN Food Systems Summit later this month in New York and COP26 that is going to be held in Glasgow later this year. Professor Lal will take questions after the lecture. So just for all our participants, if you would like to pose questions as you hear him speak, please do post them in the chat function of Zoom. If you would like to ask your question personally, uh, just type Q or question and we'll call you. Uh, and if you are having problems with your internet or your sound or video, then please do type the full question into the chat box and we will try and accommodate as many questions as we can. So without further ado, Professor Lal, we are really looking forward to your lecture with keen interest. Over to you. Thank you. I hope that you can see the screen. Is the screen visible, please? Uh, not yet, Dr. Lal. Can you press, try your share screen button again? I'll try to do that. Let's see. Not yet. Are, are you able to see the green share screen button, sir? Okay, I see it now, yes. Okay, there we are, thank you. Very good, thank you. All right, so you should be able to see the full screen. I want to begin by thank the Norwich Institute of Sustainable Development, Vice Chancellor, Professor Richardson, Professor Nitya Rao, of course, uh, Mr. Peter Innes, uh, representing the foundation, uh, Matt Heaton, Natasha Grist, uh, Aryan Barshur, many other colleagues uh, for giving me the privilege to be the first speaker of uh, the John Innes Foundation Lecture. I also want to thank you for your flexibility. I know that I, for personal reasons, had to change the date of the previous presentation. So finally, it's a great privilege to be here and with you this morning. Uh, talking about what to expect from the UN Food System Summit and COP26 in relation to soil as a, a media for food production. So I want to begin with soil, uh, the soil life nexus. Soil is a living entity. It is a habitat for 25% of all terrestrial biodiversity. Land misuse and soil mismanagement is a serious threat to soil health and biodiversity, and that has been documented quite extensively. The objective of management is to enhance and strengthen soil's capacity to support life. And in that regard, the importance of soil organic matter content and soil health in support of the life uh, cannot be overemphasized. A healthy soil looks like this, uh, full of uh, roots, full of biota, full of pores, 50% uh, pores of the total volume. And half of those pores are of course air and half water under ideal conditions. We talk about soil health and soil quality Interchangeably, they are related, but not the same. Soil quality is generally more quantitative measure, while soil health is a qualitative, and it's a soil biological property that form the basis of the soil health. Being a living entity, therefore, it also has a health like any other living entity has. But soil health is not just uh, qualitative. We are actually at soil scientists working very hard to develop quantified methods and indices of uh, monitoring, measuring, verifying, validating soil health. <clears throat> what is a sustainable soil management? Soil is like a bank account. What you take out of the soil is must be about the same amount that you put it in the soil. So in a soil, like in a bank account, we must replace whatever is removed we must respond wisely to whatever we change. We must predict what may happen from natural and anthropogenic disturbances. And we must do whatever we can to produce more from less. The goal is to return some land and water back to nature. We are already using 5.2 billion hectare. That's more than what we need. I hope 
I suggest, I recommend at least 1 billion hectare, at least 1 billion, but 2050, be returned back to nature. That's contrary to what many other people suggest that we should expand. I don't think so. And one of the other part which I like to mention is that the soil health, plant health, animal health, human health, environment health, and planetary health is one and indivisible. At the UN Food System Summit, there is also a concept of one health, but they're talking about animal health and human health. I understand that's important, especially in the context of the COVID-19. But the holistic concept is linking soil health to that of plant, animal, human environment, and planetary processes. And that comes back from John Muir's philosophy of 2010s and earlier, he was an American philosopher. He said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And that's the one health concept. What do you expect from COP26 coming up for the end of this year? One thing is that all of our leaders go there. They have a lot of slogans. They're very enthusiastic. And they make a lot of commitment, a lot of pledges. I request them, commend them. Hopefully they implement when they return home what they pledged. Implementation is very important. Why? Humans have not had to deal with such a drastic climate change since 10 to 12 million uh, ago. Uh, now the humans with population of 7.8 billion and projected to be 9.8 billion by 2050, 11.2 billion by 2100, have to deal with it increasingly so in the future. COP26 in Glasgow is a historic landmark, happened after two years, uh, for soil carbon sequestration. We hope that, that will happen. Now all hopes are on nature-based solutions at COP26 in Glasgow in November 21, to translate the words and slogans into action translate the slogans into action. That's the key part. And how do you make agriculture and sustainable soil management solution to global warming? Through prudent policy interventions, bringing about a paradigm shift in agriculture of the future, making transformational changes between now and 2050 through innovative initiatives at COP26. I must say something about soil carbon and the sustainable development goals. Soil health had several sustainable development goals, very directly impacted, primary impact, goal number two, and hunger, goal number 13, climate action, goal number 15, life on land, some secondary impact on goal number one and poverty, good health, goal number three, number six, clean water, number seven, renewable energy. Unfortunately, regrettably, sadly, the word soil did not appear in any of the primary statement of the 17, 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Thus, I strongly believe sustainable developments are not on the track for the 2030 Global Agenda because the soil has been sidelined, ignored, given a lip service. And still there's a time through the UN Food System Summit to do something about it. Regenerative agriculture is a part of the solution. Do not quite know exactly what it is, but here is one definition. It's inspired by eco-innovation. It's powered by non-carbon energy. It's driven by a circular economy and green infrastructure, but it's supported by the recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere at the bedrock of sustainable development. We must re-put back the carbon we have lost from the trees, vegetation, and soil. That was the bedrock of sustainable development. I share with you some of the data available uh, by colleagues from the UK who have published it. I especially want to uh, give my credit, uh, respect to David Paulson. Uh, he published uh, one of the co-authors of the Indo-Gangetic Plains data 
from several studies, 30 of them almost, rate of about 370 kilograms of carbon per hectare per year. That's a very good rate. I found very similar rate in many other publications. They also published in Sub-Saharan Africa, a rate of somewhere about a half a ton, 500 kilograms per hectare per year. In Brazil, the rates 400 to 500, even one ton uh, have been monitored. And many other studies globally indicated a range of about 500 to 600 kilograms per hectare per year. So somewhere between one third of a ton to about one ton of carbon sequestration per hectare per year. I'm sharing with you data from other colleagues, not my own data, but my own is very similar to this. The technical potential globally of all soil, degraded soil, polluted soil, uh, endangered soil, those soils which have lost their integrity by accelerated soil erosion, if you can restore the carbon concentration, only the organic maximum potential, the possible what can be done, can be done about two and a half gigaton per year. So between 20 and, 20 and 2100 over eight year period, several of us got together and estimated that we have a technical potential of 178 gigaton of carbon to be put back in the soils. In the vegetation, about 155, total potential about 333, which translated into carbon dioxide drawdown from the atmosphere, more than 150 parts per million of CO2. But even two and a half gigaton is hardly 20% of the fossil fuel emission at present. In addition to that fossil fuel, about one to one and a half gigaton is from land use conversion. So two and a half gigaton out of 11 to 12 gigaton is hardly 15, 20% under ideal condition. Therefore, finding alternative to fossil fuel emission by 2030 soon, uh, but definitely by 2050, and then over and above that, sequestering carbon in the terrestrial biosphere can certainly keep global warming to within two degrees centigrade, but not without finding alternative to fossil fuel. That's an important part. That brings me to the question of farming carbon. What it means is growing soil carbon as a farm commodity that must create, must create another income stream for farmers, ranchers, and land managers. They must be rewarded fairly, justly, transparently, and to the societal value of carbon. I'll come back to that. What is societal value of carbon? I took this slide from Reuters uh, yesterday. The survey of the International Emission Trading Association found members expect carbon prices in the EU to average 47 euros, $57 a ton between 2021 and 2025, and perhaps 59 euros between 2026 and 2030. Last year's survey predicted an average price of 31 euros a ton for a third phase of ETS, which runs from 2021 to 2030. Benchmark prices have been something like 53 euros. Average global carbon price needed by 2030 to put the world on track to meet sustainable development goals to curb the global climate change, maintain the temperature below 20, 63 euros. And that is a kind of price range needed. I calculated myself and published it in my simple soil oriented rather than economics kind of evaluation, 120 to 130 dollar per ton of carbon. That's 35 dollar per ton of CO2. Therefore, if a farmer sequesters half a ton of carbon per hectare, they should be compensated $65 per hectare. If they sequester one third of a ton, $43 per hectare. Please don't ask where that money will come from. We have plenty of money going into subsidies, which create disservices. Transfer that money to payment for ecosystem services that will promote farmer to adopt the best management practices. Action track three of the UN Food System. So we talk about nature positive practices. What is it? Protecting, managing, and restoring soil, strengthening biodiversity, improving water quality and renewability, adopting negative emission farming, 
negative emission farming, not emission neutral farming, negative emission farming. Reducing input of chemicals, using biostimulants and organic amendments, promoting biocircular economy, supporting the One Health concept, the way I explained, and of course, using digital innovations such as precision agriculture. There are many other practices. And some of the sustainable uh, best management practices include conservation agriculture, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, agroforestry, integration of crops with trees and livestock, practices with a positive soil ecosystem carbon budget, slogan on C rather than NPK, C and PK through integrated soil fertility management, balanced use of plant nutrients, drip fertigation rather than uh, flood irrigation. Then the question is, how do you integrate them into landscape? I pick up an example from the Atlantic Canadian sloping lands. And their, their colleagues, they are working, they talk about installing diversion terraces and grass waterways on sloping land combined with tile drainage, with water retention structure, with supplemental irrigation, such as sub-drip fertigation. So this is a kind of landscape integrated soil and water conservation example. I can take the same, and of course, conservation agriculture. I can take the same example for sloping land from the tropics. In the tropics, conservation agriculture, of course, or a landscape, agroforestry, contour hedges of perennial shrubs, such as Lucina or Glaricidia, and at the same time, livestock management, lay farming, controlled grazing over the landscapes so that we can recycle. That means growing forages and cover crops in the rotation cycle. So that would be landscape integrated system example from the tropical countries where the entire uh, landscape can be managed uh, in a judicious way. Coming back to the agriculture, 49%, uh, that's a larger estimate than 40%, terrestrial surface is used for agriculture. 77% of agriculture land, almost 4 billion hectare, out of 5.2 total, is allocated to raising animals. 70% of the global freshwater withdrawals are used for irrigation. 30 to 35% of the greenhouse gas emission directly and indirectly are contributed by agriculture. And yet one in nine, one in seven in 2020 is food insecure. And two to three in seven are malnourished. More than 2 billion people suffer from malnourishment. Deficiency of micronutrients, especially vitamins, protein. Therefore soil degradation is the cause for human malnutrition soil degradation affecting more than 30% of the land area is the cause of human malnutrition and of course hunger. So how do you meet the food demands? I think, and many people would agree that we already produce enough food. We just waste too much. We just take it for granted. 30 to 50% waste across the world, both in developed and developing countries. Access to food, which is affected by poverty, inequality, wars, and political instability, need to be improved. Distribution needs to be improved. We must find alternative sources of protein, especially plant-based protein, pulses. Education, that the pulse-based protein is quite good. Yes, some meat is essential, but pulse-based and alternative sources are very important. Accepting personal responsibility of not taking food and natural resources for granted. And increasing agronomic productivity from existing land, restoring degraded land, increasing biological nitrogen fixation by legumes and converting some agricultural land back to nature. I mentioned 1 billion hectare, perhaps even more. And how? through sustainable eco-intensification and restoration of soil health. The objective is to reconcile the need of advancing food and nutritional security with the absolute necessity of improving the environment. The goal is to make agriculture soil solution to the environment, not a problem. 
when each one of us cannot do without food and many other basic necessities that come from agriculture, how could it be maintained as a problem? It has to be a solution. And that's what we expect from the UN summit and from the COP26 to bring that transformation. Therefore, the 21st century green revolution has to be soil based, has to be ecosystem based. It must be knowledge based so that we can reduce the inputs, so we can stop degrading the environment. If we did that, we have a population which is probably going to become 9.8 billion by 2050, 7.8 billion right now in 2020, 2080, perhaps 10.6, 2111.2 per capita food consumption will go up from 2700 calories to about 3300. Cereal production must go up from million tons, about almost four. The land area needed does not have to increase. It may decrease, it should decrease if we bridge the, the yield gap, if we restore degraded soil, if we improve soil health. The fertilizer use doesn't have to be 200 million tons. It can be less than 100 million tons. If we improve the eco efficiency, if we recycle the nutrients, if we decrease the losses, if we improve the use efficiency of the fertilizer, and yet the crop yield can go up from three tons at the moment to maybe one and a half by, uh, increase by 50% by 2050, perhaps double by 2080, and go up to more than double by 2100. Therefore, we improve productivity, but reduce the area, reduce the fertilizer, reduce the water, use the best, save the rest for nature. Do not keep on taking from nature, put it back to nature, return back to nature. What do we expect from Food System Summit, which is coming up very shortly? That brings me to the question of what is a food system? Now we are going to expand from agriculture and soil to food system. It encompasses interlinked and value-adding activities, including production of food, aggregation, processing, distribution, consumption, and of course, disposal of food products. All of that is a food system from agriculture, fisheries, forestry, blue food, white food, all kinds of food and their processing, their production, their distribution, and their disposal of the waste. Product. Everything is food system. What is a sustainable food system? It has several dimensions, environmental, social, economic, cultural, institutional, policy, and governance. So like agriculture, sustainable food system should also meet these dimensions of the sustainability, both at the farmer's level and the community level and the environmental concerns, soil, water, uh, of course, in relation to the human dimension are a very important part and should not be overlooked. Now, in spite of all the great progress that we made, we still have a prevalence of more than 3 billion people who cannot afford a healthy diet. 700 million chronically malnourished, COVID-19 has increased the number from 83 to 132 million, 150 children under five are still stunted. Two billion people are malnourished, overweight and obese. And of course, 600 million people get sick every year by consuming unsafe food. So the UN Food System Summit must address these issues. The Food System Summit uh, has also compromised uh, the sustainable development goals. And at this point, I'd like to mention that the famine are man-made tragedies. Yes, natural condition aggravate the situation, but by and large, they are human creation issues which need to be addressed. Therefore, we must make famine and mass starvation politically intolerable, morally toxic, ethically unthinkable and humanly unacceptable through restoration of soil health, through improvement of World Food System Summit, through transformation of agriculture. We have the knowledge. 
we must have the political will to do it. That's what we expect from the COP26 and the World Food System Summit. COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted food production and supply chains. It has adversely affected commodity markets and trading system. It has reduced economic growth, income, and increased poverty. It has increased risks to human well-being. It had worsened inequalities. It had aggravated under malnutrition, especially in children and women. And we need to make food system resilient to pandemics, extreme climate other stressor. And the policymaker attending the food system summit must make sure that this does not happen. Again, okay. what are the limitation of the present system that we expect the food system summit to address? It has failed to end the hunger and malnutrition. It have not provided adequate nutritious food, health, diet, and safe food. And it has degraded soils, polluted water, aggravated global warming, dwindled biodiversity, denuded landscape. It should not have happened. And we expect World Food System Summit to address these issues, to translate slogans into action. we must reduce greenhouse gases from agriculture. And we can do that. We know the knowledge, we have the scientific knowledge how to do that. So the way forward in relation to food production and consumption is that the food, with the way it is produced and you know, it affects the health of soil, plants, animal, people, and the planet. It has a cascading effect on one health nexus. Therefore, it requires transformation. And one part of the transformation in mega cities, cities of more than 10 million people. There are only three in 1975, 10 in 1919, 16 in 2000, 28 in 2014, 31 in 2016, 37 at the present, 41, 2030, and by 2100, there'll be 83 mega cities in the world, more than 10 million people. And a city of 10 million people requires 6,000 tons of food a day. Therefore, the nutrients coming into the cities are a major environmental liability, but they can be asset through urban farming. So urban farming should be part of the new transformation that we are coming up, hoping that perhaps 20, 30% of the fresh produce can be grown within the city limits through skyscraper, through soil-less agriculture, soil-less aquaponics, hydroponics, aeroponics, all those kind of systems which recycle the nutrients. Then we must also consider about the social values of the resilient system. Resilient system, those which are can withstand the shock and bounce back. They maintain soil and ecosystem health. They are prone nature. They support interconnectivity and holism and they sustain soil health. So we expect that the UN Food Systems Summit would consider these resilient system. Our expectations from the meeting coming up on 23rd of September is transformation of food system, restoring soil and biophysical environment, improving social equity and addressing human dimension, adopting prudent governance, identifying and implementing site-specific game-changing solution, strengthening human resource development, and creating global science policy interface for sustainable food systems. And then taking action about it, not just the world. The mantra that I hope the World Food System System Summit will give to the world community, that is healthy soil equal to healthy diet, equal to healthy people, equal to healthy ecosystem, equal to healthy planetary processes. It's a very simple mantra, but translating into action requires every person to take a personal responsibility with the help of the policymaker, translating science into action. Food system sustainability part, it should be environmental, institutional, economic, social, cultural, moral, ethical, spiritual, and we must make sure people understand that food is medicine. A good food is a good medicine. 
and that's where nature agriculture or nutrient sensitive food production system is really the path forward. Nature positive production system must also mitigate climate change, reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, regenerate and protect critical ecosystem, reduce food waste, reduce food waste. Food waste is a crime. Producing and then wasting all those resources as much as 30 to 50% not acceptable. And we must never undermine the health or the nutritious value of the diet. The word soil must have been included in all the coalition, all the coalition. As of this morning, unfortunately, the word soil is not in any of the coalition. I hope the decision maker, the secretariat is listening and they will not forget. They will not make the same mistake that Agenda 21, Millennium Development Goal and Sustainable Development Goal did. Do not forget the word soil, which is the foundation of our program, of our life. And evolution of the UN, which I already have just mentioned, soil is missing in all. We cannot afford that. We cannot interfere with the reality. Wisdom must prevail. It must appear in all coalition that we are talking about. The coalition for soil that I would like to specifically mention to be included in the World Food System Summit announcement should read something like that. A stable coalition of action for soil health, which provides an opportunity to enhance collaboration and galvanize a critical mass of member state, civil society, research institution, UN agencies, development actors, and food and agricultural companies, and other key, key stakeholders to do what? Enhance collaboration. So that there is no duplication, there's no redundancy, there's no overlap. They must engender a system perspective, holistic approach. Remember one health concept, health of soil, plants, animal, people, ecosystem, environment, and the planet. They must support and develop globally coordinating and operating mechanism to pay farmers, for example, for ecosystem services. They must more effectively advocate for a unified system focused soil health agenda. They must develop an aggregate resource and capitalize on an increasing production capacity through education, through translation science interaction at the ground level at the village level, at the community level, at the landscape level. And they must develop and promote the use of scientific evidence-based recommendation. And they must ensure human rights-based approaches at all level, especially the most basic of all human rights, access to healthy, nutritious, and safe food, and healthy environment in which that food is grown. I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. I look forward to answering any question. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lal. I think uh, you have raised so many issues and I think there are also a uh, lot of questions that have already been coming into the chat box. So I'll request my colleague, uh, Peter Emmerich, to uh, maybe facilitate uh, this discussion, starting with some of the questions. Thank you very much, Professor Lal. That was really interesting. Uh, we've got a, a number of questions pouring in, sure. uh, and we'll see how many of them we can uh, manage to address. Uh, the first one from uh, David Dent was submitted before, and I'm slightly paraphrasing here, but uh, researchers like us have failed and are failing to persuade people to act fast enough to combat global heating, just as we failed with soil erosion and biodiversity. Providing scientific information has not been enough to get people and societies to make adequate decisions. So do you think we need to pay more attention to the way that the decisions are made, especially when the facts are uncomfortable or inconvenient? David, thank you for that excellent question. I think you, you put it uh, very correctly. Uh, just publishing scientific report is not good enough. Uh, communicating with policymakers, supporting the policymaker to make the right decision, translating science into action, and then of course, uh, uh, encouraging farmer, 
empowering farmers, especially the resource poor farmer, 70% of them in Africa and Asia elsewhere happen to be women. So those are the part that have been left out. And I think your language, uh, I have failed, you have failed, I think you are correct. We have not been working with policymakers closely enough uh, to translate science into action. We have not been involving farmers. We have not been empowering farmer uh, to be able to do the correct agriculture. And that's the way forward. That's what we need to do. You are very correct. Thank you very much. Uh, and the next question from Giovanna Alberti Tabacco from Swansea University. Uh, the Netherlands appear to be a world leader in sustainable agriculture, but using a range of really high technology approaches, uh, optimizing efficiency uh, with tightly controlled inputs of fertilizer, pesticides and water. Do you think it would be worth and feasible to create the infrastructure in developing countries in terms of training and capital investments to set up agriculture in the Dutch model? Uh, and do you think that's a model that could be exported to other developed countries as well? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, the, some of the best agricultural practices, including in Holland, elsewhere, uh, Europe, uh, uh, in North America, Pacific region, uh, they certainly need to be adopted uh, under site-specific conditions. Obviously, the modification, we got a billion small landholder farmers who have uh, one hectare, two hectare, four hectare at the most. Uh, so translating large-scale agricultural practices in the developed world, uh, the principles are the same, the concept are the same, but the human dimension issues may be different. So fine-tuning them under site-specific condition, addressing the local uh, factors that uh, inhibit their adoption uh, should be considered. With that part, uh, with the fine-tuning under local conditions, both biophysical and socioeconomic, which are very different, uh, yes, we must translate uh, resource for low output, current uh, agriculture, into very productive, environment-friendly and nutrition-sensitive agriculture. That's the need of the time, yes. Uh, Chris Jones asks, uh, can you expand on what you, uh, why you want to uh, return land to nature? Surely the land that's used under production is also highly dependent on healthy soils. Shouldn't our priority be on promoting the health of soils under production? Definitely. I would like to re restore the degraded agricultural soils. I would like to use the best agricultural soil in the best possible way. But I don't think we need 5 billion hectares of land under agriculture. If we did restore soil health, uh, I should have shown you some graph of a crop yield in Africa at the moment, which can be very easily doubled, tripled, and quadrupled. I can show some of the uh, yield of... Uh, dryland farming in South Asia, which can be very easily doubled and tripled. So by increasing productivity from existing land, uh, we do not have any need to deforest Amazon or Congo Basin or uh, uh, Southeast Asian forest or elsewhere. I think we must have a goal of producing uh, the most food that we require from the existing land and some of the agriculturally marginal land which we brought under cultivation and has, has created a lot of problem, sediment transport in the, uh, all the rivers of the world, pollution, eutrophication, algal bloom, emission of greenhouse gases, all of that. And can you imagine if you put 1 billion hectare of marginal land which are degraded back to nature, how much carbon sequestration will happen? how much uh, water conservation and renewability will improve, how much biodiversity will increase, how much buffer will happen between humanity and the wildlife. That is really something we have been rather greedy taking, taking, taking away from land, from nature. It's a time to give it back and we must. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Bill Grayson comes a question. Uh, the UN Food Systems Summit appears uh, from the outside to be a genuine attempt to bring all groups of civil society into the process of transforming the food system. However, it's come in for criticism because of its links with multinational corporations. 
Do you have any advice uh, for those of us who are concerned with issues of food sovereignty and how to engage with the food system summit process to achieve more equitable outcomes? Uh, that's a very relevant question. And I mentioned what I thought was sustainable and what were the sustainable criteria. And uh, I think uh, the local uh, producers, uh, site specific, I go back to small landholders, uh, giving them the power, empowering them uh, so that they can improve their food production system is really the great. I hope that uh, we still have a couple of weeks uh, and I think uh, this lecture is very timely. Uh, as I mentioned, soil coalition or soil health or soil hub or whatever you want to call uh, has not yet been in and it should be in. I honestly believe that if the soil health part is ignored, uh, it will have the same impact as we had with Millennium Development Goal or Sustainable Development Goal issue. Uh, mind you, regenerative agriculture needed, yes. I defined what it was. Uh, Agroecology is needed, yes. Agroforestry is needed, yes. Blue food production is needed, yes. But how can you maintain all those systems without soil health? That's a very important part to understand. Soil health is the basis of the pyramid on which all those things depend. To simply think that their soil health is included into those things is really ignoring the real issue. And that would be a serious drawback if we follow the same path as we did in the past. 2030 is only nine years away. Unfortunately, even by 2050, we'll be discussing the same problem because we sidestepped the real issue. I'm, I must say something which does not mean to criticize anybody. Whenever dignitaries go somewhere, they come off the plane, they got a beautiful tarmac uh, covered with the red carpet, and they kiss the red carpet, the real thing is few feet away and ignored. That's exactly what we do. Don't do it again. This is a time to include soil, pay it respect it deserves. Thank you. Uh, Heather Alford asks, how long do you see the benefits of soil sequestrations at the level that you're reporting? Is the amount per year constant and how do you maintain the benefits yearly rather than see the soil degrading again? If we create a positive soil carbon budget, positive ecosystem carbon budget, that means the carbon we put back into the soil through biomass is more than the carbon we lose from the soil through erosion, decomposition, leaching, harvest or whatever else. Uh, then we should always have carbon going into the soil and the terrestrial biosphere. So when people say sometimes that, yes, we have been trying to do that, but we did not gain, it's like saying my bank balance never go, goes up. Well, your bank balance cannot go up if you withdraw more than what you put in. Soil carbon is exactly the same way. If you do not put in more than what you withdraw, it will never go up. And that is a part of the thinking we have to have for site-specific condition, find out how much carbon you're losing by erosion, by mineralization, by other processes, and try to develop your farming system to add more than that. That is science. And it can be done. It should be done. It has to be done. And if we keep doing that, then soil health will be maintained. Over time, the need for using chemical will become less and less. Soil will become disease suppressive. The biodiversity will increase. It will strengthen ecosystem services. It has to happen. But we must compensate farmers for doing that. Great. Uh, incorporating two questions from Natasha Grist and Paul Quinn. Are there some areas of the world where this sustainable focus on soil is more important than others in terms of impact? Uh, so where should we focus right now geographically? And linked to that, uh, should there be some areas focusing on high food production and others focusing on soil health for ecosystem services? The global hot spots where the food system summit need to be improved are those where, of course, the poverty, malnutrition, undernutrition, uh, resource for farmers, uh, uh, one billion of them I mentioned, that is where the food system summit really uh, focus and uh, improve. Uh, that is a very high priority. Uh, that is definitely, and that is where the scope for improvement is also. The nutrition sensitive agriculture, 
food safety, water quality, which also uh, determines the food safety. All those parts need to be action. One thing that I'm really concerned is all of these things that we are talking about food system summit, how do you implement them where they are needed? That's a part which is, which is very, very critical. And how do you monitor the impact of whatever is implemented? And how do you go ahead and make a mid-course change in implementation if things are not happening, uh, if they do not happen? I think those details are missing and those details require participation of the local player, local actor, local stakeholders. It has to be bottom-up approach. And that's the only way the Food system Summit will deliver what it is supposed to deliver. All right, thank you. Uh, now, a question from Manas Chatterjee. Uh, there is a, a push for eating more legumes, but the EU, for example, does not produce uh, them in sufficient quantities for human consumption. Uh, how do you think this can be achieved sustainably? Well, the area under legume production, what we call pulses, is uh, very short. Uh, pulses are mostly grown under dry land conditions, uh, so the yields are low. Uh, most pulses, uh, the beans, the mung beans, urdu beans, pigeon peas, uh, chickpeas, um, many of them, uh, if you get a half a ton per hectare, uh, that's considered good, but the yield can be double, triple, quadruple. Um, so production, I published a paper, I think about five years ago, how to improve the productivity of uh, pulses and legumes. Um, and I, I think that can be done. Now, remember, at nowhere I said, do not eat meat. Uh, I think judicious consumption of animal-based food is fine, it's good. Uh, but rather than increasing uh, animal-based consumption 15% every year in developing economies, uh, I think we should be focused more on plant-based diet. It's also good for human health. It's also good for planetary health. It's good for environment. So balance, moderation, that's really the key, key part. Uh, pulses, alternative sources of proteins, uh, they are something, education, uh, we must promote education uh, in those parts. A healthy diet, uh, which requires really some fish, some poultry, uh, legumes, vegetable, fresh fruits, uh, that healthy diet would also lead to healthy human, also lead to healthy planet. That's an education part. Thank you. Uh, now, putting together two questions from Simyi Lim and Srijit Mishra. Uh, what do you think about carbon pricing? Is that a sustainable way to focus attention on soil health? And what's the path uh, forward in the meantime to defend soil health for countries in the global south where these uh, carbon market price signals will take longer to develop? Undervaluing a very precious commodity leads to the tragedy of the commons. Uh, whether it's air, whether it's water, ocean, whether it's biodiversity, whether it's soil, whether it's carbon. If you do not pay a farmer the right price, uh, they will not be encouraged to adopt uh, these practices. Let me give an example. We had a carbon trading market started here in the U.S. in 1990. The price at that time was $1 per ton of carbon credit. That's one ton of CO2. Uh, it went up to about $6 2005, then collapsed. Um, $6, $8, $10, that's not the price that farmers will get excited about. That's not the societal value. Of the, but that's where I make a difference between the societal value and the value determined by demand and supply market driven forces. I think we may have initially to go into the societal value based price that farmers should be paid. I came up with the $120 to $130 a ton. 30 to $35 per ton of CO2. I think that's a fair price. And will it end uh, poverty? Well, if you have a five hectare farmer in Sub-Saharan Africa and you give them 30 to $35 per hectare to sequester carbon, that's not a bad start. That will improve soil health, that will improve soil water conservation, that will increase productivity, that will improve nutritional quality. That's the only way to turn around the vicious cycle of uh, hunger, malnutrition, land degradation, climate change. I think paying farmer, and this is what I call empowering farmer. Empower farmer to pay them 
just fair and transparent price based on societal value. Do not undervalue them, do not short chain them. Paying them $8 or $10 is a good start, but not good enough. Not good enough. Thank you. Uh, now a question from Jules Siebenberg. Uh, the problem of perverse subsidies for agriculture is clearly key, just as it is for energy. Do you have thoughts about how this can be shifted to supporting farmers and nature-based solutions? I fully agree. There's a lot of money in, in subsidy. And in fact, that figure of how much it is, and well, uh, it's really, it's a huge amount. And, and some of those subsidies have been creating disservices. Take the case of flood-based irrigation, many part of the world, free electricity, keep on flooding the land. Uh, nitrogen subsidized, but not phosphorus, potassium, calcium, or micronutrients. Uh, pesticides and herbicides subsidized. When I was working in Africa at IITA, uh, plowing-based, tractor-based plowing was subsidized, and I was promoting no-tail farming. So many of these subsidies have created disservices. So reallocating those subsidy money to payment for ecosystem services and ecosystem services, only those farmers get who do it. Those who do not get it, do not get it. They do not do it, they do not get it. I think that's a way to transform. I realize that there is no new money. The existing money should be used properly, judiciously, prudently. And that's one way to do that. Or go the subsidy, instead pay for ecosystems services. Thank you. Uh, Lydia Smith has a question, but she's uh, asked to ask herself, I think. Thank you. I thought it'd be good somebody to ask a question um, other than you. Uh, thank you for a lovely lecture. And I, I'm just really interested in your views about erosion because obviously it's uh, you touched on it in many of your slides, but um, you know, you can spend a lot of time and effort improving soil health, but if the, the tillage uh, choices and I guess the, um, the types of rotation that are used predispose the soil to erosion, you know, how can, we, how can we look at attacking that? And I guess that's a social question as least as much as um, a soil science question. Lydia, you asked a very good question. Um, I was working at IITA and I had a erosion plots on 1%, 5%, 10%, 15% up to 20% slope. And I was trying to find out how much mulch cover is needed to stop erosion on 20% slope. Four ton per hectare completely stopped runoff and erosion on even up to 20% slope. Four ton per hectare of mulch. The question of how to produce it crop residue without plowing, a cover crop, not grazing, not taking away the... Uh, many people told me, hey, this residue that you want to leave under the ground is needed for farmers for cooking, for fences, for uh, building homes and many other things. I agree. But this is where if we provide farmer alternatives to meet their other demands so the residue goes on the land, that's the only way to control erosion keep the ground covered always. And that is where the farmer had to be paid ecosystem. So four ton per hectare may also be equal enough to maintain a loss of soil organic carbon. It will maintain zero level change, but six tons per hectare will increase carbon going into the soil. Dr. Dennis Greenland, I did a lot of work on that. So the basic concepts are known, both for wind erosion and water erosion. I had a lot of trouble convincing farmers, those uh, tractor hiring services and others that look, leave the ground covered, uh, provide farmers other avenues to meet their other needs. Land should be managed in such a way, in an equitable way, grains for people, residue for the soil. Maintain that equity, everything will be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a few questions from Colin Andrews. Uh, surely stopping tillage will cause agriculture CO2 emissions to plummet, and the nutrient balance can be addressed almost fully using green manure cover crops. So how, how widely applicable are approaches like this? The basic principle, you know, 
we have 300,000 known soil type in the world. So to assume that one practice is universally applicable would be rather naive, but some basic principles are definitely applicable and those basic principles can be translated into site-specific practices by understanding the biophysical socioeconomic condition. So basic principles are less return whatever you remove from soil. Keep the ground always covered. That means cover crop, crop relative mulch. Maintain uh, nutrient balance. Uh, do not simply apply nitrogen and not phosphorus and potassium. Conserve soil and water in the root zone where it falls. Those basic principles are universally applicable. How to modify them according to the resources of the farmer, slope of the land, biophysical factor, uh, and those variations do exist. So I cannot say there is one regenerative agriculture or there is a one uh, agroecology system. I think there are those basic principles which have to be used and try. And uh, there are many examples that where those successfully can be done, provided that our extension services focus on educating the farmers, working with them, making sure they are part of the decision making process. And with that, we can make a progress. Thank you. Uh, from Charlie Curtis comes the question, in your view, which countries are making the greatest advances in this and what are they doing? Uh, South American countries I feel very proud of. Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay. Uh, US uh, has certainly done very good. There are some farmers in Ohio who are uh, my role model. Uh, but unfortunately, one year is done no-till, the other year uh, is done chisel-till. Uh, cover crops still are hardly 7% of the farmers. So both in developing countries and developed countries, we have a long way to go. But we are making very good progress. There are some very good farmers and we should uh, uh, give credit to them. We should highlight their work and make them as a focus of attraction to uh, uh, scale up from their example, uh, both in developing and developed country. I think uh, UN organization, FAO, UNCCD, uh, many others, uh, uh, other regional organization, I can think about ECA uh, in uh, Latin America, they have started a program called Living Soil. Uh, I think the Living Soil program should be also translated to Sub-Saharan Africa uh, with the help of ECA and um, Agnes uh, uh, Kalibata working together. I think it can be done. There are very good examples which can serve as a role model to scale up. And I'm very positive it will happen. Thank you. Uh, Vaira Leng has asked, uh, what are the uh, environmentally friendly management practices that, that can be used to increase uh, carbon sequestration in the subsoil layers? So below 40 centimeters, uh, uh, especially in cropland. Uh, deep-rooted uh, cover crops, certainly uh, pigeon pea, uh, alpha alpha have deep roots, there are many other deep-rooted crops. Deeper you can put, the longer the carbon is stay. By the way, earthworm is a very good tool to take uh, carbon from the surface layer, lumbricus. Uh, they dig tunnels uh, way deep and they carry the biomass from the surface to the subsoil. Uh, I will not suggest uh, subsoiling or deep plowing, maybe uh, it has been done in the past, but uh, bioturbation is the idea, bioturbation, deep roots, earthworm, termites, centipedes, millipedes, macrofauna, biota, uh, and they would live under better soil, moisture and temperature condition. That means keeping the ground cover and their biomass is also their food. So those are the things, and once the soil is in a deeper soil, it has a longer mean residence time. It stays there longer. So, and deeper so subsoil below 50 centimeter are a very large reservoir of carbon. It plays a major role in the global carbon cycle, both organic and inorganic. Today, we have not talked about inorganic carbon. That's equally important. Yes, translocating carbon into the subsoil through biotic means is a key to success. Great, thank you. Uh, Rahid Mabret asks, uh, what do you think about the uh, soil security concept and SDGs lin linkages? 
I very much like the idea. I was attending the meeting at University of Sydney where uh, Alex McRatney and other colleagues put out that concept. I think it's a very good. It uh, rhymes with food security, water security, and you can't have those without salt security. So I think the concept is a very sound indeed. I've been co-author with it. Basically, it boils down to the same thing, improve soil health, restore uh, eroded and degraded soil, improve uh, soil quality, uh, restore carbon, uh, make sure you conserve soil and water. Um, I, I think it's a very sound concept. Uh, certainly, it is uh, supportive of what are the other things we have talked today. And I think it came out about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, it certainly need to be promoted more. Uh, it's a concept which focuses on soil health and its management. Anything that does that uh, has to be very good. Thank you. A question from Noel Ellis. There's been a great increase in global nitrogen input into the land. Uh, artificial nitrogen fixation has almost doubled the nitrogen fixation on land. Uh, this seems a problem. Do you see a solution? It's a problem. It's a very big problem. Uh, in developing countries, uh, China, India, uh, the rate of nitrogen application with the use efficiency under best case scenario being 30%, and I'm being very optimist, uh, most of the nitrogen applied, then the reactive nitrogen goes into water and air. Water as nitrate and air as N2O. It's a major problem. We should try to do whatever we can to improve use efficiency. The focus is not on the rate of application. The focus is on the efficiency of application. Uh, Africa does not move, use much fertilizer. I think the current rate is about 15 kilograms per hectare versus uh, almost uh, 160, 70 in India and 130 or so in the US and maybe 250 or 400 in China. But those who promoting aggressively fertilizer, I'm with them, we certainly need, but please focus on improving soil health first then make sure that the fertilizer you recommend are those which are environment friendly and they do not leak out quickly into the environment, into air and soil. If the soil is not healthy, putting fertilizer alone is not a solution. A healthy soil should be receptive of fertilizer. So the first thing to do in Africa is make soil responsive to improved use of fertilizer and varieties and other inputs. If the soils are degraded, if they do not have optimum range of organic matter content, if their soil structure is no good, if moisture and temperature are not managed, if soils are eroding, putting fertilizer in those conditions is a liability. That should we should watch out. Thank you. Uh, related to this comes a question from Barbara Harris White. Uh, when you focus on carbon, do other minerals uh, being degraded from soils map onto carbon uh, conservation and sequestration practices? And are there any trade-offs? Uh, and then also, is the concept of valuable ecosystem services uh, relevant to the improvement of so soil health? Uh, how do we convince economists of the non-monetary <laughs> values that we've listed? <laughs> I hope some economists uh, listening, uh, there's a good friend of mine, I have very high respect for them. When economists talk about agricultural practices must be profitable, profitable to who? They should be profitable to nature and the environment and human are part of the nature. When nature gains, human also gain. And a short term economic profitability by cutting carbon and cutting quick uh, economic return is a long-term liability. Long-term profitability is really, really the key part. I think that is the concept which we have to understand uh, profitable for nature as a whole on a long-term basis. I'm with you. If the short-term profitability ruined this land and environment, I would caution you stop. And I think this is something which we can always uh, discuss. And uh, so giving farmers the right price and giving farmers the societal value of living carbon 
residue is a long-term profitability for the community and nation and the world as a whole. So this is the economic we should be thinking about. Economics of maintaining the healthy environment and healthy soil. And I'm sure there are economists who fully support that. And I salute them for doing it. Thank you. Uh, from John Dixon comes a question. Complex farming and food systems issues require systems and realistic solutions, but the development institutions have not been able to translate the rhetoric of holistic approaches into the reality on the ground. So how can uh, these essential systems perspectives and implementation, implementation approaches be created? Thank you, John. Good to hear from you. Uh, he did some excellent work at CIMIT and has been up in the forefront. Uh, I was pleased to see when he received uh, Dr. Swaminathan Award two, three years back. Uh, John, this is very correct. Uh, conservation agriculture, system-based conservation agriculture globally is being adopted on 180 million hectare out of 1,500 million hectare. That's hardly 15% of 18%. So we have a long way to go. Uh, Ohio, for example, uh, where the conservation agriculture experiment started in 1960, 60 years ago, exactly 60 years ago, uh, hardly 30% of the farmers are using conservation agriculture. Only 7% of those who do uh, grow cover crops in their rotation cycle. So somewhere we have to involve farmers in the decision-making process, especially the resource poor small landholders who sometimes cannot afford the risk of getting lesser yield. When you change from conventional tail to no tail conservation, there may be some yield reduction for first few years. This is where the community, the society, the government has to step in to assure them that your loss, we will compensate you. And that payment for ecosystem services is very important. That is the step that we really have to uh, focus on. And your work, John, uh, is a role model. I think we should continue spreading that message uh, uh, from Central America to uh, Southern Africa and hopefully in Asia and elsewhere as well. And now another question from Jonathan Jones. Do we need more science or can we address the problem simply with better policy? <laughs> if we need more science, what science do we need? We will always need more science but we know enough to translate what we know into action. To keep on doing more science and not using what we know is really a misguided effort. So many times people say, do we know enough for carbon sequestration? Well, I do know enough to use what I know, but I keep on improving what I do not know. And I think that's the way it has to be. So uh, first priority is to translate science into action action through policy, action through education, action through stewardship, action through economic remuneration, whatever we can think of. But we should also identify key knowledge gap, hotspots where soils are being degraded, hotspots where soils are depleted and where we'll get big, buck, uh, big bang for our buck for carbon sequestration, identifying them. How to include inorganic carbon in soil for sequestration. 40% of the world land area under arid and semi-arid condition is going to become 50% by the end of the century because the arid lands are increasing. Inorganic carbon is a very important component of the global carbon cycle. We do not know enough about it. So that's one part. How much use efficiency can be improved by increasing soil one ton of carbon? How much saving in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, pesticide, herbicide, energy can we have by improving soil health to organic carbon. How much resilience and productivity can we have? Uh, how much saving in water can we have? Those are practical issues. We still need to know more about it. And more importantly, what is the price of carbon that we should pay farmers? That's a very important scientific question. And we should address that. But that does not mean we stop using what we already know. We know a lot. And we must vigorously uh, promote what we know. We will never reach perfection. So use what we know and keep improving the knowledge at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Sheetal Patil uh, asks, uh, you mentioned briefly about urban farming. Uh, having the potential to produce 30% of total food for people in megacities. 
uh, what are the strategies and specifically solar centered uh, strategies uh, that need to be integrated into the smart city plans uh, to make that happen, especially for Asian cities? There are several types of urban farming. Of course, one urban farming is like I do in my garden. I got uh, about 10 meter by 10 meter patch of land and I go grow vegetables in that. That's uh, one type. Uh, what I was talking about urban farming is modern type, soil-less agriculture. I think soil is such a precious commodity. It has so many other uses beyond food and fuel and pottery and uh, construction and so forth that we do not know. And if we uh, pollute all the soils we have and degrade what uh, we are using. And I was thinking about soil less agriculture. I think by 2100, our dependence on soil for food production will become less and less. It will happen. And I'm thinking urban agriculture is an opportunity where you have soil less agricultural food production system, where you recycle nutrients in human, animal, and city waste uh, in different form. Skyscraper buildings uh, where the light uh, is controlled, of course, uh, uh, water circulation, disease pressure is not very high. Nutrients brought into the city are somehow hygienically. I must mention hygienically recycled. The gray and black water is used for aquaculture and uh, other things. That is the future agriculture that I was thinking about. And that I think each large cities and num mentioned number of mega cities, almost 40 right now, 30s and 40s, going up to 83 by the 20. We must have a goal that each mega city like New Delhi or Calcutta or New York or Washington or Mexico, Rio, maybe 15 to 20% of the fresh produce consumed in the city grown within the city limit by soil-less culture. It will be hygienic, it will be safe, it will be best pressure and not be there. Uh, and this is where the investment and education has to go in. We are already thinking about going to Mars and whatever, well, if we do go even traveling to Mars, long distance traveling, uh, you're going to produce food within your cell uh, capsule. Let's try do that here in urban farming. I think the major problem is going to be feeding poor in urban center. Therefore, urban farming, COVID-19 had disrupted food production transport system. If we strengthen the local food production systems, urban agriculture, we would not have been so badly affected. That's what I mean by urban agriculture. Thank you. Uh, Oliver Dilly now asks, uh, under which climatic conditions and under what soil type uh, do you see the highest uh, potential for carbon sequestration? Normally cooler and moisture climate have more organic carbon sequestration than hotter and dry climate have. And a hotter and dry climate have more inorganic carbon sequestration potential than cooler and wetter climate have. So, uh, if I'm looking at a hot spot for carbon sequestration, I'll probably go back to most degraded soil in a cooler, moist climate, which have lost uh, most of their uh, carbon stock, and therefore we can put it back both in biomass and vegetation. Uh, identifying uh, FAO, I really respect them very much. Uh, UNCCD, same uh, same thing great organization, they should take a lead in identifying global hotspot where the deficit is the most and where the potential of restoring both organic and inorganic carbon is the largest. And that's where we should focus on. Um, and that is what I'm also thinking about uh, returning land back to nature. That's really the whole idea. Marginal agriculture land which are degraded uh, which have lost their A horizon and most of the carbon stock. If we put them back to natural vegetation, the rate of carbon sequestration would be automatically go very high. So identification at a national level uh, to implement the concept of land degradation neutrality of UNCCD, uh, that should do it. That should improve water quality, water renewability, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, it will create jobs opportunities. Um, I want, if I were to pick one spot, I'd be very biased. I can understand that. 
all the way from Afghanistan to Cambodia, the lower Himalayan hills, completely denuded, completely denuded. All those countries, they should get together rather than fight with one another to rehabilitate, to re forest the lower Himalayas. That will take care of the misery of the drought and floods. That will create job opportunity for the young people. Give them training how to do the watershed management, how to plant trees, how to grow nursery, and make a goal that all of them will work together between now and 2050 to reforest the entire lower hills from Afghanistan to Cambodia. That will bring prosperity and peace and tranquility and prosperity to the entire humanity. Thank you, Professor Lau. I think that is an excellent place to stop. Uh, thank you for all the questions that we uh, got and apologies to everyone whose uh, question we didn't manage to get to. Uh, let me hand back to Nitya. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you so much to everybody for uh, uh, such a variety of uh, questions and really engaging with this topic in so much uh, of detail. And I therefore need to actually thank uh, Professor Lal for the wonderful and really a uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture. I think you raised so many issues that has really enabled us to talk through this uh, uh, in sort of, I haven't even noticed, but I think almost 40, 45 minutes, you've been answering questions, very critical uh, questions about the Food System Summit, about the way ahead. How is this transformation from slogans to action, I think going to happen? How can we use the science that we already know. And I must say that in a lot of the comments that have come, I think everybody has appreciated your talk a lot. I think Peter was selective in reading out the questions. So he left out the appreciations about the impressive lectures and the very exciting examples and comments uh, that you made. So really, thank you so much for this um, wonderful lecture and for getting us thinking into what we need to do different if we really have to meet or start uh, reversing uh, the way we have been doing in order to even partially try to meet the goals, if not by 2030, then by 2050. And for the audience at NISD, we actually have been seeking to engage uh, with really leaders and thought leaders like Professor Lal to enable us to move from knowledge to action, to give us the confidence that actually we know enough and we can start taking action even with what we know, using, of course, transdisciplinary uh, research and approaches and also partnerships. I think we really appreciated the point you made, Professor Lal, about putting the farmer first or actually the context specificity, the location specificity, the site specificity, because with agriculture in particular and soils, you mentioned, which I didn't know, 300,000 different types of soil varieties globally. So I think this whole approach, we hope that at NISD will help us to bring together from different disciplines to make solutions for those who are really the most vulnerable to uh, contemporary changes taking place, both natural like climate change, as you mentioned, but also social uh, changes. And I just wanted to flag for our audience that over the next couple of months, we are hosting a series of thought leader seminar series. The next one is from Professor Eddie Allison at the World Fish Institute, followed by Hugo Campos, I think who's on this uh, line today from CIMIT. Uh, and also I would like to announce today that our next second NISD JIF uh, lecture, Dr. Shakuntala Haraksing Tilstead, who was the World Food Prize Laureate from 2021, has kindly accepted to deliver the next uh, JIF NISD annual uh, lecture. Uh, before I finish, I think I should thank the entire NISD team who have worked very hard to make this event happen. And also silently behind the scenes, Matt Heaton, Angela, Payne, Naomi Wang for ensuring that the technology has worked very well, perfectly today. And Professor Lal, thank you once again. And I do hope that we will have an opportunity to host you in person sometime in the future. So thank you very much to everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.